Today on America's Test Kitchen, Aaron makes Bridget foolproof pita bread. Jack challenges Julia to a taste test of international yogurts. Dan reveals the science behind perfectly proofed dough. And Keith makes Julia the Mediterranean classic shakshuka. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. I bake a lot of bread at home, but I don't bake pita bread. And that's probably a shame because supermarket pita is a pale comparison of the real deal. This is straight out of the bag from the supermarket. Now it's supposed to have a pocket. No, this has a hint of a pocket. There's really nothing in there. How am I supposed to stuff all that good lamb, shawarma and everything else into the pita? And of course it tears so easily. Is it too much to ask for a pocket in our pita, Erin? It is not too much to ask, Bridget. It's definitely doable and it's a lot of fun to make. Okay, before we start, Bridget, I want to emphasize the importance of actually weighing your ingredients. Mm. When you're baking bread or baking anything for that matter, I really highly recommend that you invest in a scale. Accurate every time and it's kind of easier to do. It is easier yep. to do. So we're going to start off with 14 and 2 thirds ounces of King Arthur bread flour and we're going to add 2 and a quarter teaspoons of instant yeast. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our water. Anytime you make ice water, you always wanna fill up your container with ice and then top it off with water. Okay. So it should be more ice to water. And I'm gonna strain this. We want 10 and a half ounces of ice water. If you did have a different brand of bread flour aside from King Arthur, you'd wanna decrease this by one ounce. Okay, okay. gotcha. So now I'm gonna add my ice water to my dry ingredients. And that's really important that we're using ice water because if it warms up too much, it's gonna ferment a little too fast and it's gonna create bubbles. In addition to that, we're gonna add four teaspoons of honey. Any type of honey is fine. And I'm also gonna add a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. Now we're just gonna turn the mixer on low speed for about one to two minutes until all that flour absorbs the water. Okay, this looks perfect. We're gonna let this sit here for about 10 minutes. We want that flour to really absorb the water, which is gonna kickstart the gluten process, which is also known as autolyse. Autolyse, 10 yes. minutes, right? 10 minutes. Okay. Well, slow fermentation is the key to a perfectly puffed pita, and we're keeping the dough as cold as possible before it goes into the fridge to ferment. And here's why. As soon as yeast meets water, fermentation begins. Now, during fermentation, two things happen. First, flavor development. Yeast gradually makes a panoply of alcohols and acids, which give bread delicious, complex flavor. But what we're focusing on here is the second process, structural development. The yeast creates carbon dioxide gas bubbles, which give the dough lift. The warmer the dough, the faster fermentation occurs. Mixing the dough with room temperature water gives the yeast a head start. So after it's been in the fridge for 24 hours, the gas bubbles have grown large. This can cause tearing later on when we roll it out. Now, we can slow fermentation down by starting with ice water. The cold temperature during mixing means the yeast doesn't get that head start before it goes into the fridge. The entire fermentation happens very slowly and the bubbles never get too big. The upshot is that we end up with a smoother dough that won't tear when we roll it out. And that's why we need ice water for the perfect pitas. Okay, so this has sat for 10 minutes. Autolise is kick-started. Mm. And now we're gonna add one and a quarter teaspoons of table salt. If you add the salt earlier, the salt is gonna draw out the moisture and it's gonna inhibit the gluten formation. So we really want that kickstart to happen. We're gonna turn this on to medium speed and we're gonna let this mix for about six to eight minutes until a dough ball forms and it clears the side of the bowl. Okay, so our dough has cleared the sides of the bowl, as mm -hmm. you can see, and we are ready to roll. Are you ready uh, to roll? I am ready to roll. This dough is fairly tacky. And you mean tacky like a good thing tacky. <laughs> yeah. So we are gonna spray down our counter. Oh. I'm just gonna knead this for about a minute. What I'm doing here is I'm just shaping it into a dough ball. And you'll notice that I'm using oil and I'm not using flour. We weighed our flour earlier and we weighed our water earlier. So I really don't wanna throw off that ratio that we worked so hard for. You don't want to use too much because you want this dough to grab onto the counter. So we have our dough ball. We are now going to divide this dough into eight pieces, you know, as best I can. And then I'm going to just going to weigh them to check myself. So I'm going to oil my bowl lightly and let's see how I did. We're looking for three and three eighths ounces for each dough ball. Gotcha. Perfect. So we have our dough balls. Can you grab that tray for yeah, me? You bet. That is also greased as I might observe here. Lightly oiled. Yep. So we are gonna shape. Do you wanna help me shape? I'm gonna show you how to do it. Otherwise, one. this means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, so we want these to be in a tight, round shape. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm basically taking the dough from the exterior and I'm really bringing it into the center of the dough. Okay, so now you want to put the seam side down uh -huh. and you just kind of like put your hand over it and you just roll it in a circle. It's grabbing onto the counter and the important thing here is that once you have a, a perfect dough ball, you flip it over, there should be no dimple. Oh. Now what would happen if one, say, had a dimple? Your pita might not perfectly puff. Okay, so now we're gonna spray these with more oil. Okay. And then we're gonna cover it with plastic wrap. So should this be uh, tightly wrapped? Yeah, so we're tightly wrapping it. What we're gonna do is put this into the fridge for about 16 to 24 hours. Okay. And that's gonna allow the yeast to slowly ferment and moderate bubbles to form, but not big bubbles. And the flavor is gonna also become more complex. Okay, Bridget, our dough is out. It has been refrigerated for about 24 hours and we're ready to roll. Okay, first I'm gonna flour our workspace. Basically, we're gonna roll the dough out. One of the most important things that we want here is we wanna make sure that these dough balls are handled properly. So one of the first steps is keep track of that side that's facing up. Okay, nice smoother side. Exactly. Put this into our bowl of flour and I'm gonna heavily and generously coat it with flour. Would you like to yes. coat a dough ball? All right, keep it in a nice shape. That's yep. the top side, exactly. the, the smoother side. Perfect. Flip it over. That's perfect. And smooth side up, right? Smooth side up. All right. You got it. Now we're just going to press it using our hands into about a five inch round disc. I usually start pressing from the inside yes. out. I want it to be even. If there are any bubbles in there, which there are because it did ferment, I just want to kind of press them out a little bit. Gotcha. All right. That looks great. Now we're going to roll it into a seven inch round. Okay. And the key here is to take our time. Start rolling from the center and work my way out. If you rush, the possibility of it sticking to the counter is greater. Make sure that the dough is always moving around and it doesn't stick, and if it does stick, stop and just lift it up and just throw some flour underneath All it. All right. All right. Ooh, it's really forgiving. So we're rolling this out into a seven inch round. Is it good? Awesome. And now we're gonna brush off any excess flour. Okay. Brush off both sides. Now we're gonna lift these up and put them onto the peel, keeping track of which side was up first. So now we're gonna put these into the oven, 425 degrees, rack to the lowest position. Any higher, the dough would actually start to set too soon and it would not puff properly. We've had a pizza stone heating up as well for about an hour. We're gonna let these bake for about one to three minutes. It can go really fast, so we really should not walk away. And this is part of the fun. And what are we looking for? We are looking for them to totally puff up like a balloon. Are they, are they both puffing? Fuck. There ah. they go. There's the pocket. That was yours, good it's job. Making a pocket. Yep. Okay, so now that they are puffed like a balloon, I'm gonna go in there and roll them over so that they can brown on the other side. Okay. All right. I will pull those out for you. Look at that. Look at them. Beautiful. Look like All little right. sea creatures. They do. Okay, they push that back in. All right, back in. And how much longer? And we're gonna let these bake for about a minute just until the bottom gets lightly browned. Awesome. Okay, so it's been about a minute and I'd say let's pull them. Steamy little pitas. Beautiful. All right. So now we're just gonna put them on this wire cooling rack. Got a little bit of color there. That's yep. good. Yep. And now we're gonna cover them with a towel. We want them to rest for about 10 minutes. Okay, Bridget, they have rested for about 10 minutes. Beautiful. And I love that just a little bit of speckled browning on it. That's all you need, just slightly browned. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna take one of the ones that we've baked off first. Just gonna cut this in half. And you know what I'm gonna look for? This pita better have a pocket. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you could put a lot of lamb in there. This pita has the perfect pocket, I would say. Look at that interior. Beautiful, lacy, mm -hmm. nice crumb. Mm. Soft and slightly chewy and... And moist. I mean, that's moist. something yep. that you don't get, again, yeah. with supermarket pitas at right. all, mm -hmm. is that they're so dry. Yeah. And the process was a lot of fun. I couldn't have asked for a better pita professor. You're a great student. If you want to make these amazing pitas at home, start by mixing ice water, oil, and honey with bread, flour, and yeast. Let it all rest, then add salt and mix again. Divide the dough into eight pieces and refrigerate overnight. Coat the dough with flour, shape into seven inch circles, and bake them two at a time until they inflate. Then flip them over and bake until lightly browned. Let them cool for 10 minutes under a blanket and serve. So from America's Test Kitchen, the practically perfect in every way pita bread. Mm. So good. Today, we're diving into the world of international yogurts with Bishop. 
Jack Bishop. I feel like I should be wearing like <laughs> reflector sunglasses. Like I'm not like cool enough for this segment already. <laughs> well, international yogurt sounds pretty mysterious. Yeah, and they're all made in the United States. <laughs> Are they really? Yeah, so the world of yogurt has really changed. The first revolution was the introduction of Greek yogurts. Mm -hmm. These are strained yogurts, thicker, creamier, lush, that really transformed the yogurt landscape in the 1990s. Half of all the yogurt we now consume in the United States is Greek style. Oh, wow. It's all made here. Yogurt is not something you want to put on a plane and <laughs> ship across have the world. It sitting in customs, right. <laughs> so dip in. All right. As we've seen all these different styles, Australian style yogurt, Bulgarian, mm. and Icelandic style yogurt. We wondered, is there something that's even more delicious than Greek yogurt? Ooh. I personally love Greek yogurt. Oh, wow. And what that's do you like delicious. about that? Um, its texture is a little bit looser, and I kind of like that. It's not so heavy. It almost tastes like sour cream. It's mm -hmm. like I should be dipping potato chips in this. So these are all whole milk. Mm -hmm. They're all cow's milk. Um, yes, you'll see different uh, cultures on the label. The experts we spoke to said the biggest differences are length of time that the yogurt is fermented mm -hmm. and the temperature at which it's fermented. And the type of cultures is not so important as the way the yogurt is cultured. Well, that's interesting. So as you're tasting, you're going to notice big textural differences. <laughs> yes. And that is some stiff yogurt. Yeah, and the big thing here is whether or not the yogurt is strained. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. So Greek yogurt is strained, which is why it's so much thicker and creamier than what mm. I would call classic American style yogurt. Icelandic mm. yogurt is also strained. The Australian yogurt and the Bulgarian yogurt <laughs> are not strained. So in addition to textural differences, which will be very obvious, mm -hmm. some of these are tartar, mm. some of them are a little bit more savory, yeah. um, some are a little sweeter, and that's really about the fermentation process. Interesting. The texture is dramatic as you can get in yogurt. From this, which is downright soupy, to that which is almost like wallpaper paste. I actually love the flavors of all of them. This last one is a bit more acidic, but I could see that working in some instances. This one is by far the thickest, but again, would be great in a dip, especially if you're adding liquid ingredients like vinegar or lemon juice or lime juice, it could handle that. And this one, I, this one actually might be my favorite, just eating straight out of hand. It is smooth, it has some complexity, its texture is somewhat in the middle. So I'd say this is my favorite, followed by these two and this one last. Do you want to know where we're going? Where are we, go where are we going? Let's go to this country first. We're going very far, far away. We are? We're going down under. Oh! Uh, so again, these are all made in the United States, but mm -hmm. this is Australian style yogurt from a company named Wallaby. We thought it was actually very similar to mm -hmm. some of the classic American style yogurts that I grew up with and you grew up with that are sort of moderately thick, um, not too thin, not too thick, mm -hmm. um, and the flavor is kind of middle of the road. Yep, nice uh, and clean. Not super tart, not super savory, mm -hmm. just delicious. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to this country. So this is Iceland. This is very similar to the Greek yogurt. It's really creamy and thick. It's strained. It's just got an amazing texture. Yeah, it almost whipped. Okay, this one was quite thick. So this is our favorite Greek yogurt by that is a strained yogurt, lovely texture, a little lemony, a little acidic. Mm -hmm. That's just a wonderful ingredient. And last but not last least. Last but not least. This is the Bulgarian mayonnaise. style yogurt. <laughs> this looks like a mayonnaise bottle. <laughs> yes, you pay extra, I think, for that bottle. It is the most expensive yogurt here. This one is really, really thin, as you saw. Mm -hmm. Also really funky and savory. Yeah. It had what I would call kind of cheesy notes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was a big yogurt. <laughs> so there you have it. In the world of international yogurts, you'll find a wide variety of flavors and textures, but you can't go wrong. When you bake a loaf of bread, you want the dough to expand as much as possible on the counter before you bake it. This is called proofing. To tell if your dough is ready to bake, you poke it with a finger or knuckle like this. If it springs back right away, it needs more time. If it leaves a deep indentation and doesn't spring back at all, you've waited too long. But if it springs back slowly and leaves a slight indentation like this, it's ready to go. And here's why. The yeast in the loaf is consuming sugars and pumping the dough with gas. And the network of gluten is trapping a lot of it, but not all of it. Some is always escaping. So we need a constant supply of fresh gas. As the yeast runs out of sugar, the gas production slows. Poking at this point will leave an indent. If you don't bake the loaf now, it will eventually start to deflate. And that is overproofed. Wait, you know what? There's a way better way to explain this. This bouncy house is a lot like our bread dough. And my assistant Joe is demonstrating the poke test. Now the bouncy house is inflated by a fan run by a generator. Now that's our yeast. 
As long as the fan is running, the house stays inflated. But as soon as the generator runs out of fuel, which is our sugar, it starts to deflate. If Joe tries to bounce on it now, it won't spring back. And if we don't bake this bouncy house, it's gonna be completely deflated. That's why the poke test is key to hitting that proofing sweet spot. Shakshuka is a North African dish consisting of poached eggs and a fragrant red sauce. It is becoming very popular, popping up on brunch menus everywhere, and I was even served it on a plane recently, which says a lot about shashuka and that airline. And today, Keith's going to show us how easy it is to make at home. So it's not surprising the popularity of this dish because it's really great. So like you said, it's from North Africa. And what it is is eggs that are gently poached in a tomato sauce. That tomato sauce is flavored with red peppers, garlic, a lot of warm spices. It's a really simple dish to make, but we found to make it foolproof, it was about getting the sauce texture just right. Mm. So we're gonna start with a 28 ounce can of whole tomatoes that I've drained as the base of our sauce. I'm just gonna put this into a blender. Now we really like whole tomatoes because they don't have any additives in them and they break down nicely. Our next ingredient are roasted red peppers. So I have one and a half cups of jarred roasted peppers here. We've drained them. It's gonna go in the blender with our tomatoes. Okay. So our next ingredient, and this is one of the first key ingredients to our sauce, was pita bread. Now you normally see shakshuka served with pita bread, but actually we're gonna take a little bit of that and put it in the sauce. The starches from that are gonna thicken the sauce and keep it nice and cohesive and a nice texture all the way through cooking. So I'm just gonna take about a third of one of these, and I'm gonna cut the remainder into wedges to serve later. All right, so these wedges are for serving. That's for later. And only one third of one of them is going in the sauce. Yep, and I'm just gonna cut these into half inch pieces, and it should be about a half cup. Okay, so a half cup, that's gonna go in with our other <laughs> ingredients. Now, you've also noticed that I'm putting everything into a blender here. Yes. A little strange. A, a lot of the recipes we found use a chunky sauce, chunks of tomato, chunks of red peppers, but we really found in order to get those eggs cooked through evenly, we wanted a pureed sauce. I'm gonna blend this for a minute or two and get that nice and smooth. Now that we have our sauce base, we can build the aromatics. I have a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil in this 12 inch skillet. We're gonna heat that over medium heat. As that's heating up, I'm gonna prep our garlic. I have four cloves of garlic here. We're actually gonna slice these today. It looks like our oil is about ready. It's starting to shimmer a little bit. I'm gonna get the garlic in there because if we get this too hot, the garlic's gonna go too fast. So we're just gonna stir this around. What we want to look for is that uh, garlic will start to get a little golden around the edges. Okay, you can start to see that we're getting a little bit of browning here, but since I have so many spices, I'm gonna get them in there now before our garlic gets too, too dark. So I have a tablespoon of tomato paste. I have two teaspoons of ground coriander, two teaspoons of smoked paprika, mm. teaspoon of cumin, half teaspoon of table salt, quarter teaspoon of pepper, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. So we're just gonna cook this with the garlic, let that tomato paste brown and get a nice rust color, and it should take one to two minutes. Our tomato paste is browned, it's nice and rust colored. Now we can add our tomato and pepper puree to that. I have another one and a half cups of roasted red peppers that have been cut into quarter inch pieces. It will just give the sauce a little bit more texture. Okay, now that this is all mixed together, we're gonna just reduce this down to a simmer. We're gonna come back and stir it occasionally. It's been 10 minutes and we can check the consistency of our sauce. Slightly thickened, you can see, but as I draw that spatula through, it will kind of slowly come back into that channel. So I think we are ready to cook our eggs. So I'm actually gonna remove this from the heat. I'm actually gonna remove it from the burner too because we don't want any more heat going into this as we put our eggs onto the top. So I'm just gonna smooth that off, make a nice place for our eggs to sit. I'm just gonna take a spoon and make some indentations on the top of this. Seven indentations around the edge and one in the center to cook our eight eggs. Okay, so I have one egg here and I'll start and I'm gonna ask you to help me crack some eggs. You got it. Egg number eight. And that goes right in the center. We still have one problem is that eggs have a tendency to cook differently. The whites are going to take a little bit longer to set than the yolks do. So we're gonna give the whites a little bit of help. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start taking this sauce and pulling it up over those whites all the way around. All right. What do you think? I think it's interesting. Egg art. 
We're gonna slide this back over to our burner on medium heat, so we're gonna bring that up to a simmer. Once that's simmering and kind of bubbling over the entire surface, we're gonna put our lid on and cook that for about four to five minutes. And we're gonna come back out for four to five minutes and check to see if the eggs have started to film over. If they haven't started to film over, we can adjust our heat up or down. And then after that initial four or five minutes, we're gonna cook it for another one to two minutes until the eggs are set. Okay. Getting the eggs to cook evenly in shakshuka can be tricky. Here's why. Inside a pan, heat moves in convection currents. The liquid at the bottom of the pan heats up and travels towards the top. When the sauce is jam-packed with big pieces of red peppers and tomatoes, the chunks inhibit the convection currents that transfer heat to the eggs, so they cook unevenly. Pureeing the sauce, however, ensures that the eggs are surrounded by a consistently smooth fluid sauce that the convection currents can easily move through unimpeded. And that's why using the blender is key to evenly cooked eggs in our shakshuka. Let's check on our eggs. It smells great. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks great too. So I can feel this with the back of the spoon. Yeah, the whites are set, but you can still feel that the yolks are liquidy. It's gonna be perfect. I have a half a cup of cilantro that I'm gonna sprinkle oh. over the top here. This is just chopped. I'm also gonna add an ounce of feta cheese that's crumbled. This is about a quarter cup. Mm. And I also have a quarter cup of Kalamata olives that have been sliced. Now that's a looker. So I'm interested to see how you serve this. So you can see that that yolk has set up and the white has set up, so it's actually not that hard to get an egg out of oh, here. Oh, so just, just a large serving spoon, you can kind of carve out each egg. Yeah, and you can take some of the sauce and just fill in around it. The smell is amazing. Okay, a wedge of pita for you. Thank you. You have to do the yolk break, right? Oh. You want that yolk to get into that sauce and right. enrich it. So, oh yeah, look at that. Oh, a little of that yolk on that fragrant sauce. Mmm. Delicious. Oh, it's so good. Well, I watched you put a lot of spices in there, but I don't taste any one of them distinctly. It's just a fragrant sauce. Yeah, it's you get a little bit of heat from the black pepper and the cayenne pepper, but then you have those nice kind of sweet, warm spices, the coriander, the cumin. And the roasted flavor of those roasted red peppers. That gives it a heartiness that actually, I know this is served on brunch menus a lot, but as I said earlier, this would be an amazing Tuesday night dinner. Keith, this is delicious. It's great, isn't it? You can yeah. see why this is so popular. Yeah. So there you have it. If you want to make shakshuka at home, puree canned tomatoes, roasted red peppers, and pita bread into a sauce in the blender. Saute some garlic and spices, then stir in the sauce along with some diced roast red peppers and simmer for 10 minutes. Make small divots in the mixture, place raw eggs into the divots, and spoon some of the sauce over the egg whites. Cover the skillet with a lid and simmer gently until the eggs are cooked through. Finally, sprinkle with cilantro, feta, and olives before serving. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a great new recipe for eggs in spicy tomato and roasted red pepper sauce. This is going into rotation on our house. Is this better than the airplane? Oh yeah, like you have to ask. Great. <laughs>